Okay, I think it's now time for the next speaker, Elena, who is, uh, I think she's right now approaching the, here. So, uh, oh, sorry, forgot me, the introduction. So she's a, a researcher working right now at ICLA, Institute Catalan of, 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 of uh, Research Water. And uh, she's specializing in, um, in nano for all the treatment of, of water and, and pollutants, et cetera, et cetera. And her talk is gonna be focalized on electrocatalytic remediation of contaminated water. We'll go in nano B technology enabled. Okay, so thank you, it's your time. Okay, so until the presentation comes up, um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is actually my first presential talk and it feels really good to talk to people and not to a computer. So it's great to be here anyway, in spite of the pandemics. Um, so today I will present um, some of the results from the project that has been running since uh, 2017. Um, and I will talk a little bit about my take on the role of nanotechnology in water treatment. So, um, oops, sorry, this is very sensitive, okay. So, um, the project in question, this is an ERC starting grant um, that is focused on the development of uh, nanostructured, so in the first place graphene, but also other nanostructured materials for electrochemical water treatment. So normally I'd say a little bit about what an ERC grant is, but I'm sure that everybody here knows what an ERC grant is, and I know you have several, and the ICN2 as well. So um, this is basically the team. Some of these faces you may actually know. So Luis uh, Pires, he was actually working before he did his PhD at ICN2. Um, so normally these grants are, are not actually very common in, in our more conservative, let's say, water world. Um, I think that I counted in, in, since the start of an ERC program, there has been only maybe 10 projects with, with the word water in them. So um, normally we do much more applied research and here I will tell you a little bit about what we did in, in this project. So uh, first I introduce uh, uh, the concept of electrochemical systems for water treatment. So they are really uh, not mainstream in, in terms of water treatment. Uh, they are not yet widely applied, uh, but they have several advantages. Um, and I believe they're really the technology of the future. So uh, here I listed some of them. They do have a very modular design and are very well suited for distributed and decentralized water treatment. Uh, that is also going to be very much implemented in the future as we, as we combat water scarcity. They are also very robust. They can deal with, with all kinds of, of contaminated water and pollutants, um, uh, versatile, operate, they operate at ambient temperature and pressure unless you design them differently. And uh, the most important uh, characteristics are here at the bottom. So they use no chemicals. Uh, all other advanced treatment options that we, that we have are based on the usage of chemicals, which has a very high incorporated uh, cost and, and embedded energy. So for the production of these chemicals, for their transport and application. So these systems are chemical free. And secondly, they don't generate any waste streams. So uh, our last line of defense, let's say uh, in, in, in water treatment is reverse osmosis, but this generates also huge amounts of, of concentrate streams that have to be disposed of. Uh, so uh, the key challenges and part of the reason why, why these systems haven't been applied on a larger scale yet uh, is that typically the, the current and conversion efficiency for removing really trace contaminants from water, so trace organic, inorganic pollutants, uh, this is normally low. So here I have a graph uh, just to illustrate how also a disappearance of one contaminant does not mean that your treatment was successful. So this is an example of perfluorooctanoic acid. This is a very, very persistent compound, and I will say a little bit more about these compounds uh, later. So here in the red line, you can see how the compound does disappear, but it forms byproducts. So we also need to make sure that there's nothing, um, let's say toxic left in this water that we're treating. And most importantly, uh, the energy consumption tends to be very high. So um, this is an example for a BDD. So this is the abbreviation of a boron doped diamond electrode. And this is kind of a, a golden standard for an electrode material in, in water treatment and in many other applications actually. Um, 
So the energy consumption is high because this electrode is very expensive. It costs about 6,000 euros at least per square meter, which means that we cannot have a, a, a huge electrode surface area. And therefore our heterogeneous reaction is then limited, of course. So we, we get in the end high energy consumption. And the second thing is that at all electrode materials, uh, BDD and many others, uh, mixed metal oxide anodes, so all commercial materials are very quick in oxidizing chloride. And chloride is an ion that, that is um, a naturally occurring anion in all water. So it cannot be avoided. This chloride forms chlorine uh, and at some uh, electrodes like these BDD and basically all electrodes that have high oxidizing power, it is oxidized further to chlorate and perchlorate. And these are toxic anions. So these are really limiting the application of any electrochemical process for water treatment because it is very hard, hard to deal with, with these contaminants. And chlorine obviously uh, can react very quickly with the organic matter that is always present and form chlorinated byproducts. And actually this graph uh, here at, at the bottom right is one of the first results that I obtained as a, as a postdoc starting to work in electrochemistry, which was that the, the toxicity after treatment is increased um, 160 times. So very discouraging, but uh, I, I continued. So um, the limitations and some of them I just mentioned uh, of, of all these existing commercial electrode materials is formation of uh, chlorine and also in some cases chlorate and perchlorate. So it is very hard to, to deal with that and it is practically impossible to, to, to avoid. And uh, also the price of uh, also of mix, mixed metal oxides, maybe they're about 4,000 euros per square meter. BDD is six, uh, well, here it's six, uh, it's at 6,500. In each case, they are very expensive materials. In this case, boron of diamond electrode is made using a chemical vapor deposition. This cannot be uh, cheap ever. So um, we really had to look uh, for a material that can be produced um, using a low cost method and then thus has a chance to compete in the market and to actually be applied for water treatment. So um, the holy grail basically uh, uh, of, of electrochemical water treatment would be, well, not only that you have a low cost material, of course, but also that you have a material with high electrocatalytic activity. And here I again emphasize these contaminants, PFAS is the abbreviation of poly and perfluoroalkyl substances. So these are the contaminants also that are now really in the focus of um, uh, the latest European Green Deal calls and so on. So they are really persistent pollutants that we, that we cannot get rid of. So every molecule that is emitted and these molecules are uh, uh, everywhere. They are used in Teflon, they are used in, in all kinds of uh, uh, industrial chemicals, uh, industrial processes and so on. Every single one of them that is released remains in the environment. So they are so persistent that they are even found in, in, in polar bears. And that was 20 or 30 years ago. So um, this is really uh, a niche application for electrochemical treatment because uh, neck, uh, apart from plasma-based processes um, that are also really um, very green and underdeveloped technology, electrochemical processes are the only one who can really degrade these contaminants. We cannot degrade them with ozonation, with advanced oxidation processes. We cannot do anything to them. So um, this is really the niche application for this treatment. Um, also, because electrocatalysis is a heterogeneous process, ideally, whatever material we can come up with should uh, be made also in three-dimensional geometry. So that way we can really um, enhance this convective mass transfer of these trace pollutants, because here we're talking about contaminants that are present at uh, nanogram, uh, at most microgram per liter level. So um, what we did, uh, we started looking at uh, graphene and uh, well, more precisely, uh, uh, set reduced graphene oxide. So here I normally also explain a little bit what each of the graphene types is, but again, probably here it, this, this, is, uh, this is not necessary at all at this conference. So in terms of uh, water treatment, uh, reduced graphene oxide coated materials. So generally this was coated graphite felt, carbon felt and so on, so carbon-based materials. 
They have been explored um, as cathodes for in situ electrochemical production of hydrogen peroxide, because we already know that this actually, uh, the, the, this type of coatings, they accelerate um, the reduction of oxygen to H2O2. Uh, there has been, uh, when I started working on this topic, there has been a huge amount of work done in the fields of energy storage supercapacitors. So really, um, sensors as well, other research fields, and very, very limited work in the field of water treatment. So we started looking at RGO-based materials. So um, what we wanted was to synthesize a three-dimensional graphene-based sponge foam or anything like that. Um, of course, if we would uh, do that uh, without any kind of template, we get something like this picture here with this uh, graphene aerogel on a, on a flower. So this is something that you cannot really do anything with. So uh, we need to be practical as, as water engineers. We, we need to think about the material that can be manipulated and not something as fragile as this. So uh, typical templates, graphite, carbon, felt, they don't serve us. So we really wanted to do incineration of persistent contaminants. So we need an anode. So we need a material that is stable to anodic polarization. And graphite and carbon felt, they really start degrading very fast uh, at very low potentials of already 0 0.2, 0 0.3 volts. They start burning out basically. So uh, we are normally working at potentials of three volts, four volts. So significantly higher than that. So we needed also something that is also thermally uh, and structurally stable uh, and that can withstand uh, the, the synthesis process for the coating of the Sargio. And we, we started looking at using mineral wool. So mineral wool, this is a completely non-glamorous material. So this is normally used in, in construction to isolate buildings. This is very cheap. We got inspired to do so by, uh, by a paper where they investigated uh, this mineral wool as a jewel heater coated with graphene. And we, um, we invented, let's say, our own, our own process. How to, how to produce uh, a graphene-based sponge using this as a support uh, for electrochemical water treatment. And this is actually now being protected uh, with, a, with a world uh, patent application. So I will tell you a little bit about how this performs for us. So, um, well, first we, we did manage to get something truly low cost. So the cost of our, of our material is less than 50 euros per square meter. So if we remember what I said before about 6,000 euros per square meter, this is really a, a big, big difference. Um, the very interesting thing about this material is because it, it's, it's a graphene coated uh, material, essentially it's a graphene based sponge, we can easily introduce all kinds of dopants. And this is what we are playing at the moment. So we can introduce different uh, atoms, boron, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. We can introduce 2D materials, maxens, so all kinds of things. And we already know that we can uh, tailor using these kind of strategies, we can tailor the electrocatalytic activity and also surface properties of this sponge for the removal of certain groups of contaminants, which I think is, is really, really interesting. Um, we also, so straight after starting with this, um, because there is a significant amount of, of research now about different kinds of materials, electric materials for water treatment. However, the stability is often really not mentioned in the studies disregarded. So we really looked into whether this material is stable. And to our surprise, I have to admit, it, it turned out to be really stable to anodic polarization. We think that this is because um, some kind of covalent bonding or strong adhesion in each case with the, the um, SCO2, which is the main component of our template and graphene. But uh, we really uh, never saw even at the highest current densities that we go to. So we are talking about maybe uh, three, 200, 300 amps per square meter. So these are potentials of five, six volts uh, or more we never detect um, any graphene release, let's say. Um, in, we never detect any change in the electrodes, so it is completely stable in our system. It is also structurally stable because of the template, so we can really roll it, squeeze it, use it in all kinds of geometries. And this is the photo of the reactor that we normally use. So this is really, um, for us, this is small. This is about five centimeter in radius. For us, this is a very small reactor. So now we are actually looking at some kind of uh, pre-pilot, let's say, reactors, 
because we really need to go to a higher uh, TRL level to see this material um, really applied. Uh, we also always try to evaluate our systems under realistic conditions, and this is very important. So we use low conductivity electrolytes. There's no point in using anything superconductive. This is not water, this is just your solution. So uh, we try to investigate uh, our system under really realistic conditions. So, um, and also uh, all our experiments are done in a way that can be more easily upscaled. So it's one pass flow through mode, uh, where we play with the flow rate, we play with current to get the most of, of our system. So um, here I, uh, I will explain maybe a little bit first about the oxidants we produce. So in electrochemical treatment, there are two ways to oxidize your, your compound. One is direct electron transfer. So your compound comes to the electrode, loses electrons and gets oxidized. And another one is indirect, which means by oxidizing water, we are producing ozone, uh, we are producing um, hydrogen peroxide at the cathode from, from the oxygen reduction. And these species, uh, they, together with the hydroxyl radicals, which are very strong oxidant species that we also know we're forming, they attack the molecule and then further degrade it. So uh, here we just uh, played, so these graphs, they show uh, different oxidants. So ozone, uh, chlorine, and hydrogen peroxide in different flow directions. So anode, cathode, cathode, anode. So it's not really important to maybe to look them more carefully. It's what is important is to understand that these bars, they are changing in the amounts depending on which one is the last electrode, let's say. So that allows us, so if we have cathode anode here for ozone, anodically produced ozone, of course, is not lost. So we detect more. So anyhow, this is basically how we investigated the performance of our system and oxygen generation, different currents. Um, uh, here we use, this is BRGO stands for a boron doped uh, reduced graphene oxide anode and NRGO is a nitrogen doped reduced graphene oxide anode. What we also know is, although the hydroxyl radicals here are not presented, we know we generate, we, we measured a lot of them actually, and um, uh, NRGO really not only forms this peroxide, but these inactive sites also catalyze its decomposition or, or activation to hydroxyl radical because hydrogen peroxide on its own is not going to do anything. With contaminants, this actually needs to be, all this is a strong, strong oxidant. It has very slow reaction kinetics with all organics. So we actually need to activate it to, to hydroxyl radical. But the most important result here is in the, in the middle and this graph here below that shows the CV. So, this chloride that we formed was measured for um, a really brackish uh, solution. So we added uh, 20 millimolar of sodium chloride here. And the chlorine that we obtain indicates a current efficiency for chlorine production of 0.04%. Actually, we normally never, this is the maximum that we have measured. And when we also do cyclic voltammetry, so here we, we used, um, for an example of phosphate buffer and, and uh, sodium chloride solutions having same conductivity and also um, uh, same pH, uh, we uh, basically do not form chlorine we, or we barely form any chloride. And we also never measure chlorate and perchlorate. And this is really the main difference with all other materials. So none of the other commercial materials can do this. Why graphene is doing this, to be honest, we don't know. We probably need to um, search for uh, help from a, I don't know, theoretical modeling guy. Um, so, um, but this is really, really good news. Um, so um, how we normally do our experiments. So uh, like I said, it's all done in one pass mode. Uh, so we are really trying to imitate how this reactor would work in, in real life. Uh, we always first do just open circuit, which is this uh, OC, what it stands for, to just uh, investigate how much are contaminants absorbed without any current on these sponges. And some of there are here. An example is the, 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 the blue triangles. This is triclosan. Um, while others that are more pol polar, so, uh, so the green triangles, for example, this is diatrizoid. This is normally... This is an X-ray agent that you normally get in the hospital when you want to do a scan. So this is very polar, but also very, very persistent, very difficult to oxidize. All of these contaminants, actually I should say here that we always work with, with very persistent contaminants to oxidation. So we don't just take any contaminant, we take something that is difficult to oxidize, and then we know if we can degrade that one, then we can degrade also anything else. So um, we can see how uh, this impact of current obviously can be uh, better observed for 
contaminants that are polar that don't really absorb because if they absorb you apply current and you still well you just see less of them let's say um, uh, here this is not presented because I don't have time but we also know that even for the ones that are absorbed we know that they are degraded because we have identified some of their byproducts we have also extracted our sponges to detect their amounts and so on so what we really want is this absorption so it makes it more difficult to show your data but it's actually preferential because it allows you to concentrate these trace pollutants and then degrade them. So we also see some interesting new mechanisms. Uh, we believe that many of these aromatic contaminants actually interact with PP stacking. So they kind of dock on the surface of, of this graphene coating. And uh, uh, we believe they also uh, interact via this direct electron tra transfer actually quite a lot. But in each case, there are multiple mechanisms at play. So we have absorption, electrosorption, electrochemical degradation, and so on. So it's not easy to do these studies, um, but um, certainly it's very interesting. So um, uh, the most important result we got, except, uh, well, apart from, from this low electrocatalytic activity source chloride, is the cap capability of, these, uh, of this material to degrade um, perfluorinated uh, compounds. So uh, this breakage of CF bond is pretty amazing. The fact that we can do that. So this is one of the strongest uh, bonds in nature. Um, so uh, we uh, actually investigated uh, several of, of these PFAS um, and we investigated a little bit how uh, chain length impacts uh, their degradation. So here, uh, the, the, these uh, schemes below represent C4, C8, and C6 uh, uh, PFAS. So some of them are sulfonate, some of them are acids. I should say that these are just models for us for very persistent PFAS, especially the short chain ones. They basically bypass almost any treatment. Many of them also bypass the membrane. So they are very, very difficult to, to, to oxidize and to catch, let's say. Um, but I should say that there are uh, uh, about 4,700 uh, cast numbers that correspond to, to FIFA. So this is, this is really just, uh, just uh, uh, a small uh, representative part of for these contaminants. So um, what we see is that these compounds are um, uh, also really not, uh, not absorbed. They are only removed when we apply current. And at the end of each of our experiments, we always like to do this uh, final open circuit, as we, as we call it, to investigate really if there's anything more coming out. And in this case, for these contaminants, we did see uh, uh, 40 to 50% of compound is really electrosorbed. Uh, still, the, the portion of the compound that is degraded, when we close the, the mass balance for sulfide and fluoride, uh, we see that it's almost completely defluorinated and the, the well, completely desulfonated. But more importantly, the, the defluorination efficiency is higher than 80%, which is really, really good. So uh, we believe that this is a very promising result because this, again, is done in a low conductivity solution. So um, with low initial concentration of PFAS. We already know that when we increase the conductivity and we, when we have a little bit different connection of our sponges because they are limited, uh, they don't have a conductivity of a metal, of course. Uh, so uh, we already know that we can uh, achieve complete degradation and avoid this interaction via electrosorption only completely. So um, uh, another, Another result that we, uh, that we got with these sponges is related to, to this infection. Okay, so um, here what we, uh, what we got is basically a complete uh, killing of Escherichia coli. Um, and uh, uh, this is without any chlorine added. So uh, what happens here is that uh, uh, we have a mechanism of electroporation. Normally for this, we need uh, huge strengths of electric field in kilovolt. Here, we don't have that. We have about 10 volts of total cell potential, but because of this nanostructure of, 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 uh, of the electrodes, graphene sponge electrodes, uh, I guess this field gets uh, increased several orders of magnitude and we have uh, introduction of pores in the membranes and of the cell and basically the intracellular material leaks out. And one more just interesting result to that is that 
due to the um, capacity properties of graphene, we actually can achieve the same performance by applying intermittent current, which means that we can have huge energy savings um, uh, compared to a continuous current application. So here I will actually, because I need, uh, well, I don't have any more time and I will need to skip part of my presentation. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I will just skip to take home messages. So, um, so I think uh, we will have to soon go to alternative water resources, uh, especially in, in, in um, water scarce areas like Spain and, and other Mediterranean countries. So we will need to be looking into gray water and rainwater and other sources. So we need to make sure that we have technologies that are low cost and can be applied at a small scale to treat this. So uh, PFAS is really in the spotlight. So Europe is catching up a little bit with US in that sense, but there is a lot of research going on on the destruction of PFAS. It's a big problem. Um, we believe that our material can contribute to the field in, in that sense and, and to the world of water treatment, uh, being uh, this low tendency to form or, well, no formation of bio toxic byproducts and, and this low cost that we have, the, the main characteristics of this material. Um, we got here by using really knowledge transfer from other fields, and I think this is the way to go. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's all basically that I think I will finish here. And if anybody has a question, please. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Thank, thanks Anna, for your time also. Uh, any question from people here in the audience? No, Maria Jose. <laughs> I know you, you play. Yeah. I see. Okay. Uh, very, very interesting talk. Um, first of all, I, um, I would like to ask a question about yeah, the, this, uh, the mineral gold yeah, with the graphene because, uh, okay, it's very porous, <laughs> uh, but sometimes uh, uh, it's very good because uh, they can uh, go inside and, and have a, uh, you know, a treatment that it can be very efficient. But then uh, I'm, I'm just wondering on the regeneration of this, because uh, sometimes when something is very porous, yeah, you can have the other effect that they can be uh, falling uh, uh, that, or passivating with the things that they cannot uh, go out, and so I don't know what about the regeneration of this, uh, uh, how, how is this to, to clean up then? Okay, so um, it is true that it's porous, but it's not microporous, and this would be the problem. If for microporous, mesoporous materials, things get inside so much that, that this is one of the limitations of activated carbon in water treatment. That's why they normally have to burn it if they want to regenerate it. So um, uh, we really, um, uh, did not have to investigate so far any regeneration strategy because we don't see any passivation. Mm -hmm. So we always apply current. Mm -hmm. Basically, I have to say that we didn't get yet to a stage of treating something like a reverse osmosis concentrate, mm -hmm. right? But we did treat wastewater and, and well, okay, tap water doesn't have that much organics, but when working with wastewater, we don't see any passivation by, by these organics. And actually, interestingly, we never even see scaling on the cathode, which is another limitation of electrochemical water treatment. So um, the, the pollutants, when we look into the ones that are absorbed, uh, it's what I was mentioning a little bit before, when we extract them, we see, the, we compare actually their extraction when we have sponge with current and sponge without current, just as an absorbent. There's a huge difference in concentrations there. So they are really being degraded, so absorbed and degraded. So probably after a long, 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 long operation, you would need to throw it out or regenerate, but it is so cheap that it really doesn't matter, I think. Okay, okay. no, yeah, that, that is uh, very nice. And, and the other thing is uh, quite uh, uh, because of the chlorine, no? that, uh, that is an issue for uh, the electrochemical system for water treatment. But uh, uh, we are aware that uh, we are using also the, uh, in the water treatment uh, chlorine for the disinfection. Uh, so with um, the, 
hypochlorite could be an interesting, yeah, uh, because what, which is the main problem there? That the, because the, the normal treatments also use uh, chlorine. Can you, it's not possible to tune that you can have a chlorine and, or? And no byproducts, no. <laughs> no. So chlorine is one of the greatest inventions. Once we started disinfecting water is once we stopped dying. Okay, so this is the disinfectant that will always be used to, to send water to our homes because we need residual disinfectant in, in, in the tubes. Uh, our system, when I talk about chlorine free, I don't mean I want to compete with the water disinfection in a water treatment plant. No, no, this is really just point of use. So at home to get rid of chlorine and chlorinated byproducts, meaning small ones, I use Brita, activated carbon. Uh, in this way, what we can say is that we can really avoid this in the treatment of contaminated water, not necessarily drinking water, because you don't really want to disinfect anything that is not drinking water. So it's really for, for, for any, for example, PFAS rich streams like uh, washing liquids of ion exchange resins, reverse osmosis brines, even also groundwater, why not? So anything where, where decentralized treatment makes sense, this makes, the, 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 I think it's a good idea, let's say. But I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, we have to move for the, for the sure. next talk. And anyway, thanks for the, Thank for the nice presentation. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs>